Um, so the talk I'm going to give tonight is really about the process that surrounds product development. So the theme of this is how to get your product engineering team running like clockwork. Um, and really what this is is a set of best practices that I've collected over the last 15 or so years. Um, everything I'm talking about here is battle tested in one way or another. Um, it is certainly not the only way to do things. Um, some of this is opinionated and specific to what I've experienced and what's worked for me. Um, but hopefully there's a couple takeaways in there. My goal is at the end of this, if you walk out of here with one thing that you'll go back and implement with your team, that would be a success for me. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions as we go. If something uh, you know, is, is, is striking your curiosity and you wanna raise your hand and ask a question, feel free as we go. We don't need to wait till the end. Sound good? All right. Cool. Um, so a little about me. Uh, these are some of the companies I've worked for over the last 15 or so years. A couple of startups that aren't mentioned here. Um, so that's kind of like the high level about me. Um, most of the work I've done has been on consumer facing products. Um, just about everything. I have worked on some B2B products, but they've been uh, focused a little more on kind of the business and consumer, the business users are still sort of a customer view of the, of the whole process. Well, as it turns out, a lot of this does work well for kind of more the enterprise level, um, you know, size of company. The practices I have here kind of uh, apply across all companies and can be scaled up and down, and I'll try and call that out as I go. But a lot of this is based on a little bit more of a, of a larger company size. So, uh, but like I said, there should be stuff in there and value for everybody. Why focus on process? Why is this what I decide to talk about of all the topics in the world? So. I believe that as a species, it is our agreements with one another that actually allow unrelated people to come together to achieve great things, right? So if you look at all of humans' accomplishments over the course of our existence, they are because large bodies of people had agreements and protocols and processes they followed to be able to do great things. So in software development, our process is really our set of agreements. Um, so as we start to get into the details of how we build a process and how we think about a process, we're really talking about a set of agreements that we're setting up. So, cool. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, common problems in software development. Um, so these are some of the things I think a lot of us have probably experienced at one point or another. Lack of clarity around vision, goals, progress, estimates and release dates end up being inaccurate, midstream change changes to priorities and focus, and then uncoordinated launches on the tail end of that with customers and with other stakeholders. How many folks in here have experienced some version of this in their work, like in what they've done? Yeah, just about everybody, right? So um, the goal of this is to not be a silver bullet and say we're gonna solve every problem, um, but it is to hopefully alleviate some of the pain that you'll see. In um, that's kind of the setup. These are some of the common problems that we see in software development. Um, so what should a good process accomplish? So some of the key factors that we'd want to have in our process uh, would be predictability of our releases, accountability without unhealthy pressure, ability to handle ad hoc requests, right? You know, you've two buttoned up of a plan and then you get something that wasn't planned, how do you deal with that? Avoiding rework once engineering work actually starts, um, and then keeping PMs in sync on expectations along with leadership, engineering, designers, kind of we all know what's going on, we all know what the status is, we all know where the project's headed and then keeping the team happy and calm and knowing things are under control. So um, this is sort of what we're aiming for at the end of this. We'll see how well we did. All right, so kind of the roadmap of where the talk is going. This is kind of the four big areas that I'm gonna try and cover. Um, so broken into two main sections, planning and execution. Um, on the planning side, strategic priorities, product strategy. So strategic priorities being more of the top-down portion of the process. So this is kind of the direction and input and guidance we want from our executives and from our senior leaders, uh, maybe our founders if we're at a smaller company. Um, product strategy is more of the bottoms-up approach that the teams are putting together and PMs specifically usually are leading, like putting together what is our product strategy for the group or the team that you're leading. Um, and then you get into the execution piece. Um, I've got a bunch of tool, tools that I'm gonna share and kind of go over, a lot of which you're probably using in one form or another already. Um, I've got some opinionated approaches in there that maybe you'll learn something from, but um, lots of stuff you've probably seen before. And then I'll get into the weeds a little bit with agile development and kind of the more specific nuance of how to actually execute on the team. And this is where we get into uh, everything from tech design and product briefs um, and this checkpoint process I'm gonna introduce in a little bit. Sound good? All right, cool. 
First section, strategic priorities. So this is kind of the top down portion of planning. So it's broken up into two big areas that I'll talk about key initiatives and company OKRs. And I'll cover OKRs in a little bit as well if anybody's not as familiar with those. So key initiatives. So at the beginning of planning cycles, hopefully we're getting some guidance from senior executives. This doesn't always happen in conjunction with planning, but uh, one of the things that we really want from our leadership is are there new business opportunities that we're not seeing? Is there a new line of business we need to launch? Do we need to reorganize our people to better provide the market and customers with what we think is the right opportunity? Um, senior leadership founders typically have a unique perspective. You know, they've got the perspective of investors and of the markets, competitive dynamics. You know, they're relying on their instincts a little bit, and you know, hopefully they have good instincts. Uh, that we're trusting our leaders, that they are good leaders and they do have good instincts. If you don't feel that way about your leadership and your CEO, you may want to <laughs> reconsider where you're working. Um, but, but that unique perspective they bring is usually what leads to other new product lines. So these are all ones that I've experienced in my career in one form or another. Um, when I was at MSN, uh, Microsoft made the decision to launch Bing, which was sort of adjacent. I eventually went to work in Bing, um, but that was a huge strategic you know, investment, a new key initiative that they launched. Um, when I was working at Amazon, uh, we were still in the download and purchase music sector, which believe it or not, wasn't that long ago, 2012, 2013. And uh, they launched the streaming product, which was Prime Music. Um, so again, big key initiative, strategic priority, shifting resources, reorganizing, big change. Uh, when I worked at Uber, um, we launched Uber Health, uh, which was adjacent to the team that I worked on in Uber for Business. Um, and it used a lot of the same shared technology stack and the same platform that we, we um, built with Uber Central, which is another product. And then uh, since I've been at Zillow, uh, Zillow Offers is, of course, the new product that Zillow has launched in recent years. So again, this is kind of what we want from leadership. This is, this is kind of the level we want them to be thinking at. And it's not always easy to coach up and to get your leadership to bubble up to think at this level, but in an ideal world, you know, this is the level of, of planning and thinking that hopefully they're doing. So the other piece that we hope to get from leadership is company OKRs. And I'll get into specifics to OKRs, but just stick with me for a minute. Um, fundamentally, OKRs should be unifying, motivating, and fundamental to our business. Um, the ones that are set at the company level should be the most important strategic goals that we're going for. Um, they should be few in number. Ideally, this is a single digit number of OKRs that you're going after as a company. And then ideally, we're using the combination of any potential new key initiatives along with the company OKRs to trickle down into what we're doing at the team level product strategies and the OKRs we're going to set at the team level. About planning. So our, our friend, as our friend Dilbert Dooley notes here, you know, five years is probably too long. Our competitors just made our new five-year plan moot. While we were strategizing, they were doing something, I believe it's called work, right? And you may get this pushback, depending, especially in a smaller company, you may get this pushback that, hey, we don't really have the cycles and time to go do all this planning work and do all this upfront investment, spend all these hours to put this document together. We need to execute. We need to go get stuff done. And I would push back on that. I think that you don't want to overinvest, but having a product strategy is foundational in order to align the team and the product vision that was mentioned before. I think having that written down, have everybody having a chance to give input and buy into what that document is and what that, that plan is, it, it, it's worth a lot. It's worth a ton. Um, and I think if you're just executing all the time, you, you don't have enough time to step back and really look at the big picture and then properly plan for it to actually get stuff done. Yes? So is it okay to, uh, basically, if we are in a situation where kind of the same thing, right? So yeah. they are saying that hey, we have to go with the execution. So is it okay to, and we are getting a big pushback towards creating a document. So is it okay to basically go in parallel as the execution is going on, maybe the initial stage and start working on the document to create the product strategy? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and in, in that type of situation, I would say, you know, it may be tough to carve out time and it's probably the hardest thing to do, but if you can carve out the time, if it takes some nights and weekends, I would just do it anyway and write it and have it presentable and then reveal it, right? And say, look, this is what we're planning for the next six months. Let's, let's have the review, let's talk about this. Let's get everybody's input and make this part of our process. Um, so yeah, I mean, honestly, I just wrote a doc at Zillow for my whole group for 2020 and there's a layer of planning that's going on kind of at the SLT founder level. Um, and it wasn't, nobody asked me to do it. Nobody said, hey, go write this strategic plan. And I said, I'm just doing this with my group. So I've got a group of about 40 people and we all got together and we, we wrote this doc. And now we're very easily able to update what we're doing. And when we're asked for a 2020 plans, it's like, here it is. And everybody's like, oh, wow, you've, you've put a lot of thought into this. It's like, yeah, we did. So 
Um, I think you can do it even if you're not asked per se. Um, yeah, you just gotta carve out the time is the hard part. Yeah? Uh, in this plan, you mentioned that also the strategic uh, mm -hmm. picture is described. Mm -hmm. Is it part of your role to challenge this strategic picture or? It could be. I mean, it absolutely could be. Um, I think it depends on the dynamics of your company, right? I mean, if, you, if you're going against kind of the, the core foundation or value proposition to the company, you think that, you know, that may be a bit beyond what you want to propose. But certainly within the realm of like what you own and what you work on and kind of the engineers and people you work with, if you think there's a better approach and a better direction, this is the opportunity to do it. I think this is the place where you put that together and you propose it and you get feedback and you may get shot down. You have to be ready for that. But I think through the document writing process, what happens is you end up really thoroughly thinking through your ideas and you wind up forcing yourself to kind of answer the question before somebody asks it. Like you kind of poke holes in your own story until you're like, oh, I should think about that. Oh, I should go get a piece of data about that. Oh, I should go talk to that person first. And as you do that and you're writing it all down, you're like, wow, this feels pretty, pretty solid now. Like it's pretty defendable is the key when you're done with all of it. Um, yeah, so in terms of a document outline, um, again, doesn't have to be verbatim, but this is some of the key things that I found to be really helpful in a product strategy document like this. Um, I've talked a little bit about some of these already, um, but team OKRs, initiatives are a big thing. You wanna have a cut line, you know, it's in bold for a reason. I think that's, you know, if you were just to give the executive summary, the cut line is probably what they care the most about. What are you saying you can do and can't do within the given time period? Uh, so make sure that's in there and that's thoughtful. You're gonna be doing this with t-shirt size estimates. If you're familiar with that term, like kind of t-shirt size, small, medium, large. And, and at the end of the day, you have to translate that into some kind of person months that you could uh, decrement against your available resource, your available engineering uh, capacity. So at some point you're doing some math and it's very kind of swag early stage, but at that point in your process, you need to have some confidence and talk to the right engineering leaders so that you have um, um, a plan that you can, you can propose. Um, Cool, so yeah, and then the goal at the end of all this work is to get it in front of your leadership and other stakeholders and get everybody kind of aligned that you get the thumbs up when that's, that's what you wanna do. Cool, um, all right, I'm gonna jump to the next section here. Um, so next section, PM Toolkit, this goes through a lot of tools and, and approaches that folks are probably familiar with. There's a little bit of unique spin on some of them, um, and I'll just kind of go through this, um, and we can stop for any questions as we go. So. Overview, um, the big chunks of you know, what we're doing and how we're approaching our, our planning and execution process. So in terms of the backlog, I think there's inputs that come from a lot of different places. <clears throat> You're gonna get it from brainstorming and from that big planning effort that hopefully you just did. Um, sales and customer support, if you're working with a sales team or you have customer support or any other customer signal, maybe directly from customers is another place you might get input. Um, of course, if there's technical migrations, other tech that work that you need to do is coming from the engineering team, all that should go into your product backlog that's then prioritized. The output of that ends up being a resource plan and a product roadmap. And those are two different things, and I go into some details about those in the next couple of slides. Um, but high-level resourcing is all about week by week, engineer by engineer, what are we working on? What are we going to actually have people do week to week? And then the product roadmap is um, really a product pivot of that same information. What are the product uh, features and launches that we're going to line up against? There's another piece here, which is a product tracker. I call this optional, um, although I have had a lot of success with it. My last two or three companies, we've done some form of this. Um, and it is basically a way to bubble up this information, for sort of an executive review. And this is where you put in dates and you put in enough about your launch status and enough detail, it's a status report. Uh, but having that as a separate artifact outside of like your day-to-day -day process is a good way to, to kind of uh, separate those two things um, in terms of the executive information versus information that you're using within the team. Cool. All right, so going into a little bit of detail on each of these, I won't belabor this too much, I think, Everybody in here has probably seen a product backlog or has a product backlog uh, that they're working with. Um, I like to have two cut lines. I think one about what have you committed to for the given time period, like you're saying, I'm definitely doing this. Another one that is, this is the stuff that's on deck that we're pretty sure we're gonna do. And then there's this ice box of great idea, maybe we'll get to it one day. It's not lost, it's on the backlog. Uh, everything below that line. Cool, a uh, little bit of details on kind of what is in the backlog. 
Um, these should be projects, right? This isn't tasks. This isn't you know nuanced bugs or, or individual tasks. This is like project work, roughly two weeks or more. Um, feature and platform investments only. Bugs track separately. You know this can be in Jira. I actually prefer having a separate spreadsheet or a specific backlog management software. Monday.com is a good one. I've, I've I tweeted around with recently. Asana is always good. Um, but having that backlog is kind of its own standalone entity that can be reviewed and, and people can give input to at any point. How to prioritize the backlog is like a whole nother conversation for another talk. But at the high level, I like this, what I call modified rice. You may have seen rice before reach impact, confidence, effort, prioritization. But instead of how that's described, what I like to do is take the given OKR that we think a project is going to drive and then score the impact of that given backlog item against that OKR. So the OKR is to increase UUs by some percent. Uh, we think this project's going to drive that uh, three on a scale of one to five or a four scale to one to five. Definitely subjective, you know, but at least gives some numerical input into how you prioritize versus just, you know, how people are feeling. Um, so there's the input that is the impact you hope to have and then the other input that is the cost. Um, and those two things are netted out against each other. Typically, you'll weight the input heavier. If you have multiple inputs, you would do a weight between those. Um, but the idea is at the end of this, you got a score at the end. So each, each baccalaureate item has a number associated with it. You sort by that number, and then you've got some kind of valid input to, to do the prioritization, numerical input. Cool. Um, keep moving on. Roadmap example. So I'm going to go into some detail about what these numbers mean, um, but essentially they're milestones. And there's a couple specific ones that I propose in this checkpoint process. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute, but the, the overview of the roadmap is the idea is you've got project by project, who the leads are, and specifically calling out the engineering lead as well as the product manager lead is really important because the engineering lead is going to have a lot of responsibility in owning a project from end to end, and we should declare who that is, not just kind of leave it open to whoever's up next kind of thing. Um, and you know, this is a nice overview, big just kind of macro way to step back and be like, well, what are we working on? When do we think stuff's going to land? When do we think stuff's going to ship? Um, and it ends up being a really good conversation point for the team. So my teams review this every week um, as part of their normal sprint planning cadence. Um, and everybody has a good sense of kind of where things are going and what projects are coming up next. A little more detail about that. Um, it can be the single source of truth if you decide not to do the project tracker, which I'm going to get into in a second. Uh, this roadmap can be the single source of truth for your dates and status of given projects. That can be the place that people go to see what's going on with, with your projects. Um, and if you're going to do it that way, you would include AB results and release status as well. Um, and it's also, it's reasonable to just have the first milestone as you start projects, which may be just finishing requirements or finishing UX design or that first piece of the puzzle. It's okay to have a project that is just up to that point, And then you're waiting for that part to be done before you can plan out the rest which I would actually lean towards in general versus putting a swag date on there that's completely made up that then you're gonna miss for sure. Um, cool. The other tool, if you remember back to the beginning's product roadmap, you had the eng uh, or the, the resource plan and you had uh, the roadmap. This is the resource plan. So it's a pivot of a lot of the same information, but the idea is you're going person by person here, week by week. And what this allows you to do is plan out who's gonna work on what when. Um, and it's okay to have some groupings on here. You know, you're not going to capture every bug that somebody's working on, but if somebody's going to focus on bugs or focus on tech debt for a week, you would just put that on there as such, bug fixing, tech debt, operations, et cetera. And what's nice is you include out of the office, you include holidays, if somebody's new and they're ramping up, you would include that. And from an engineering manager perspective, it's a great view to know macro level what your team's working on and what the priorities are and who's focused on what. Um, just a little more detail about that. I kind of mentioned a lot of this already. Um, I think the only other thing that's worth mentioning is that it, this can also help with career planning. If you're an engineering manager and you've got engineers, this can be a great way to look forward and say, here's what we think you know, would be interesting for you to work on. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's make sure we're fitting the puzzle pieces together in a way that you're growing, you're, you're able to reach your goals, you're working towards the things that are important to you. Um, and I have a good view of kind of where you're focused and what areas you want to work on. And it's much easier to kind of plan people's work out. Um, and then they can get excited about what's coming up. You can also use this for the design team. I haven't done this yet, but I feel I've always wanted to. I think you could do the same pivot for designers as well. I think you do the exact same thing with your design team. Cool. Um, so last piece here in this section, um, 
project tracker, this is, remember that kind of executive view of, of the information. So you'd be taking what's on the roadmap, potentially what's in your research plan, and bubbling up like the most important top level projects. This is gonna have just the really key dates, some level of status. Uh, we actually built a custom tool for this at Zillow very recently. A, uh, a coworker of mine and I, mostly him, but the two of us together built a React Redux full application that basically is this. Um, but you can certainly use a slide deck to do it. And what's great is you can use this as the way you do your status reporting up to executives, other stakeholders, other teams, et cetera. It's like, hey, what's going on in your org? When's that going to ship? Here's the link. Everybody go check it out. There's not back and forth over Slack or email or this spreadsheet, that spreadsheet. It's like you have one place to do it. So um, I found a lot of success in this. We've used this a couple places uh, over the last couple of years. So, uh, Right, this is some more detail about it. I'm going to go into the details about the checkpoints um, in kind of the next section, so I won't talk too much about that yet. Um, but again, this will be the source of truth if you use it uh, and reviewed roughly every two weeks with kind of cross-functional leadership and hopefully your senior leadership as well. Cool, all right, about to jump into the last section. Um, this is kind of the most tactical section. This is really kind of down at the front lines in the weeds of working day to day with engineering teams and with product teams. Um, this is really how we use a lot of the tools we just discussed. Um, this is probably also the most opinionated section. There's lots of ways to do this, but this is kind of what I've found some success with. Um, so let me, let me jump in a little bit. Back to our friend Dilbert. Um, Pure agile, and this may be a controversial statement to some if there's any agile, pure, agile purists, purists out there. Um, we're gonna try something called agile program. That means no more planning, no more document. Just start writing code and complaining. Glad it has a name. Great, that was your training. Um, and honestly, I, I've witnessed situations where it's not too far off from that. Um, my experience has been when you focus too much on being agile or you know, following the rules of Scrum perfectly, you actually create a lot of overhead. The intention for that process is to be really lightweight and agile and we're doing things fast. But when you start getting into retrospective, sprint planning, pre-planning, costing, velocity, burn down charts, all these facets that go into Scrum and Agile, my experience is it takes a hell of a lot of time to do that and do it well. And a lot of engineers don't love it. Like they think they do, but then when they actually do it, like, oh, I gotta go and cost this meeting. I gotta sit in this room for two and a half hours, wait for my turn, and then like try and cost these things on the fly and spend a lot of time doing it. So what I propose is the project checkpoint process. So it's sort of a layer on top of that. There's still a lot of like the agile principles and fast iteration and coding and QA that, that goes together, um, but you take a little bit different approach to it. So the biggest thing about this, and I get into more in the next slide, is that it's more date driven than it is sprint driven. Right? Sprints are artificial containers. They're a week, two weeks, great. What does that mean? It's just a time, a period of time on the calendar. It doesn't mean we can, like, engineering work doesn't line up perfectly to a two week time period. It just doesn't. Some stuff takes three days, some stuff takes three months, you know, and very rarely does it fit perfectly into a sprint. So the idea here is that um, we start with our product brief and our UX design, we have a checkpoint, we say, okay, requirements are ready. And that doesn't mean that every I is dotted, every T is crossed, like we can't start until we have every red line perfect. It means that we have enough so that engineering can then go and do detailed costing. And actually the tech lead who's on that project is gonna go and walk through their dev design doc and lay out the nuance of what they think is needed to build the application, build out the tasks in Jira or Asana, or whatever you're using, and bring that back into whatever tracking software you're working with, whether that's the project tracker, whether it's the roadmap, and lay out those dates. And then those dates, you actually have a lot of confidence in now because you've done the requirements work, engineers actually going to costing, and you've laid out dates that you're pretty confident in. You're like, yeah, this is pretty accurate. It's not, you're gonna handle 100% of the time, but they'll be much more accurate than early on just trying to swag where you think something will land. Um, so that's kind of the first two crucial steps that are kind of unique to this process. And that all has to happen kind of before the sprint starts. So you still have the concept of sprints, but they become really more just weekly meetings, your sprint planning. And what you're doing is you're checking in on your project plan, you're checking in on the dates that you've set, and you're talking about, okay, here's the next thing that's coming up, I'm gonna work on the dev design doc for that, or hey, our UX requirements are gonna be done by the end of the week, you can start the dev design doc the following week, et cetera. Um, and then once you're through those processes, then you're doing the core coding, QA, bug fix, and release, kind of the stuff we're all used to doing. Um, usually there's another checkpoint if you're working on more customer-facing software, where there'll be an A-B test and you're starting that, that could also be a private beta, depending on, on how you're set up. And then this is where you get into some of the iteration and results analysis, 
Um, you may make some tweaks. There may be a V2 that comes out of the customer feedback, but you're doing that kind of all in this phase, and then eventually you're hitting 100% and saying, okay, this is out, this is live. All right, a little more detail on that. Um, like I mentioned, date-driven versus sprint-driven. Um, we're holding the team accountable to the dates as opposed to task burndowns and sprint plans. Right? We no longer are we tracking velocity and burn downs and we don't need to cost every item. If an engineer wants to cost every task, they can certainly do that. But what we hold them accountable to is like the commitment they made. Well, we think we're going to do the project on this Friday. Great. That's, that's what the, the focus is on, not how many hours or how many points or the burn down or velocity or the rate that they're, that they're performing in a given sprint. Um, key is the dates come from the engineering team. Right? They got to come bottoms up. They should never come tops down. There are some exceptions, right? If you have an external customer commitment, there's a specific date on the calendar that you're trying to hit for either a holiday season or for shopping season, whatever the case may be. There are dynamics beyond your control. But in those, you know, you've got to have the conversation about the triple constraint. If people have heard of that, basically scope, resourcing, and time. If you're saying that the uh, date is fixed, then scope and resourcing have to be adjusted. One of those two have to be adjusted. You need more people or you got to cut the scope down if the date's fixed. And that's a conversation you have to be able to have with, with leadership. You can't have all three, basically, is the, is the principle. Um, so this, this scales with project size. Not everything will need the full checkpoint process and a full product brief written and a full dev design doc and you know, this, this kind of bigger process. But you can scale this down to be a one pager, uh, you know, a link to the UX spec, and some level of costing, which could just be done directly in Asana or Jira, whatever you're using. Um, so it, it can scale down to smaller projects as well, and you end up having multiple of those. Um, cool. So it's the same toolkit either way. All right, so a couple more artifacts here. Um, the product brief, I mentioned this a few times already. Uh, what goes into a product brief? I won't go through every one here, but there's sort of this idea of why are we doing this? What is the problem we're solving? What is the promise we have? Um, research insights, what are the OKRs we're trying to target with this? Are there dependencies? What's in scope, out of scope? Functional requirements, UX and visual design, feature discovery experience, sort of how do I find this feature? How are people gonna use it? Go to market risk, FAQ. Um, single product brief can cover multiple releases with sub product briefs. So you may have one big product brief that'll be for some whole new set of features that you're gonna build. We're gonna launch a payment system. We haven't ever accepted money before. We're gonna launch a payment system. And there's gonna be four or five different product briefs that may come from that because you're gonna have this multi-year effort maybe towards building that, for example. But at the bare minimum on the other end of the spectrum, functional requirements UX design are kind of the absolute minimums that you would have for maybe like the one pager kind of quick turn version of it. Um, and then tech design docs. So this is the checkpoint two piece. That's checkpoint one, checkpoint two. Similarly, there's a lot of stuff that can go into this, block diagrams, secret diagrams, API definition, services and artifacts impacted, um, lots of technical detail around triggers, actions, et cetera, uh, all the test plan components. But the biggest thing that comes out of this is the task breakdown and costing. So once this is done, we should know roughly what the project looks like and how long it's gonna take and all the tasks associated with it. So this is um, some results that um, I gathered when I was working at Uber. There was a six month period where I did a little bit of retrospective. I did a version of this talk for the Uber Eats organization. And uh, one of the things they wanted to see was like, hey, what are the results of this process? Okay, so I went back and kind of looked through and tried to determine you know, specifically what, what the impact was. Um, so you know, we had more thoughtful product design and I think there was less rework, um, less last minute scramble to get UX and product requirements done, relatively high planning accuracy. So only two of the 25 projects we completed in that six month period actually went beyond the dates we stated. So we were pretty accurate with our estimates, which was, which was great. Um, drove accountability. It set expectations with sales and marketing. Um, the group I worked for, there was a really big sales force and a big marketing team that cared a lot about when's it coming, when's it coming, when can I tell customers? So it meant a lot that we were pretty close to when we said, because they would set up marketing campaigns and ad spend, and a lot of like activity around when we thought new things were gonna release, especially released in like big new platforms like Uber Events or Uber Central. You know, these were like new product offerings that were coming to market. Um, so yeah, gave the right le uh, level of visibility for stakeholders as well. Cool, so that was some of the kind of results. Um, one last section here. Um, this is what I call the clockwork execution process. So this is sort of even one level down. It's uh, okay, so we've done this planning, we've got our tasks, and now we're like executing. We're in the sprint. We're actually doing the day-to-day -day work. Uh, 
I propose two backlogs, one that is the product backlog, which is sort of the output of that tech design doc and the product brief and all that work. Here's the project and all the tasks associated with it. But then separately, you would have a bug backlog. So, right, stuff breaks, you're gonna have bugs, you need to prioritize those separately. They're not gonna be easy to prioritize against feature work usually. Some people have blended these together. My experience, I think it's better to have two. And then you can include some small features in there too. There's a little UI tweak we wanna make. We think this icon should be different you know, whatever, the drop down should look different, et cetera. Those kinds of things can go into that same bug backlog and be prioritized against each other. Those two things come together for the weekly sprint plan. Um, the goal is to have this done before the sprint starts and then each engineer brings a set of tasks that they're gonna work on. So when you're doing sprint planning, it's literally just, what are you working on this week? Great, let's review it. Maybe as the manager of that team, you might have a couple other pieces of input. You may go, oh, I need you to grab this. There's this other thing, who can take this, et cetera, et cetera. But the goal is to get that to a place where um, everybody's got sort of their work lined up for the week. Um, and then if you're continuously deploying to prod, if you're on a CI CD pipeline, you can get things out very easily. Um, the end of the sprint doesn't really matter anymore. You're shipping whenever stuff's done and you're adhering to the schedule and to the product milestones that you set, the project milestones you set. Um, and it's less about when the sprint begins and end and you're just checking in every week. So we call it sprints, but it's really just like a weekly check-in. Cool, so similar, uh, some results from that approach. Um, these are the projects we shipped. We shipped about 25, so it was a team uh, of 35 across the whole org. We had shorter sprint planning meetings. Uh, sprint planning became a review, like I mentioned, of the week versus the whole expensive costing and scoping session. Uh, we kept the bug queues pretty down. They were about 15 bugs on average, and we only had one team member leave in that six months. So generally speaking it was well received i've i've applied this as well in my my current teams and it has also gone pretty well like the, i've gotten really good feedback across the board we've made some tweaks and some nuanced changes to the to the way we do it with our group but it's basically the same same approach same principles all right so pretty much um towards the end here artifacts and meetings cheat sheet so this is kind of everything we talked about it was a lot um the details are all in the slides that we just went through, but this is sort of the high level of everything we covered. Um, set of meetings that you would, you would start to engage with, artifacts that we would create. And again, it doesn't have to be comprehensive. I, like I said, I'd be happy if you took one or two things from all this and thought I could really use that or that's a good approach or that's something interesting I can bring back to my team. Um, that's, that would be great. Cool. All right, final thoughts. All processes are a bit mess messy, none are perfect. So figure out what works for your team. Find the right balance of what provides value without being a burden. And I think the key is what provides value, right? Um, I think you should always be refining that, thinking about that, putting real hours and real time against how do we work? Are we approaching this problem correctly? Are we approaching our work correctly? Um, agreement on the approach, I believe, is actually more important than the specific way you do it. I think just having everybody on the same page with like, yes, this is how we're gonna do this and everybody aligned. Um, getting buy-in across the, the org on, on the process you wanna use is important. Um, the narrative form, I, I kind of hinted at this a little bit, um, but the idea that it drives clarity and helps to capture plans, I think is huge. I love Google Docs. Like as soon as that commenting feature came out a few years ago, it was just like, wow, I just saved myself hours and hours of meeting time. Cause you can actually go in and comment and go back and forth and get feedback on things. Um, and then the last bullet point here, leaders create clarity from chaos. This is sort of a theme I've been working with a lot of my PMs on. Um, as organizations get complex and software gets more and more difficult to manage, um, you know, our job as leaders is to go in and try and create some clarity from that. I think that's a lot of the value we provide to the org.